So today we're going to be talking about your initiative, uh, basically your story, um, and all the questions we're going to uh, talk in a formal manner. You're going to be talking in a formal manner because everything that comes out your mouth, we're going to uh, put in a chapter. All the other calls was kind of, the first one was kind of get your initiative out. We, we did the, um, the summit, so you have a feel for your initiative and other people's initiative. And, and now we're just going to get it and, and capture it fully. And yours is uh, civility through transformational leadership. Transitional. Transitional leadership. Transitional leadership. Yes, like your book. Excellent. Your uh, is your audio. I think your volume might be a little bit low. Or okay, is that better? Yeah, it's better. You going in the mic? I see you have microphone, earpiece, all these fancy <laughs> in this office here. Excellent. So let's start with um, with, with your name, your initiative, who you are, and I, and, and brag and brag. Okay. <laughs> well, I I am Vinny Cochran. Um, I am a speaker, trainer, coach, author, um, publisher, um, all around entrepreneur, and I've been an entrepreneur for probably about eighteen, twenty years. Um, and I've been very fortunate uh, to come up with this initiative called Civility Through Transitional Leadership. And what that is, is the thing that I've realized, you know, in my journey in the Marine Corps, because I spent 30 plus years in the United States Marine Corps and achieved the highest rank. One of the things I realized when it comes to leadership is most people and most groups or organizations are never ever successful or truly successful until the individuals that are part of those groups learn how to lead themselves. Um, it's you know no different than taking a basketball team with the starting five players. Um, you might have one really great player, but at the very end, if each of those players you know, don't all find a leadership within themselves to get on the court and do their best in whatever time they have on the court, the team is not going to be able to succeed. Um, so everybody has to be able to find um, the leadership within themselves. And that occurs in our everyday lives, um, throughout our lives in different transitional periods. Um, when you get married, you transition into you know, being a married couple, when you leave high school, you transition into what we refer to as the real world. You know, I had to transition and join in the military. You know, all of these different lifestyle changes that we make is what we have to learn how to master. And by being able to master our own transitions in life, we can then take a good look in the mirror at ourselves and figure out what we're good at what we're bad at, what we need help with within ourselves, and then and only then, you know, can we help the world as a whole be a more civil place. Wow, that's incredible. And why did you establish this concept of civility? Actually, let's, let me ask you this one for you. What are you most passionate about? I'm very passionate about helping other individuals um, find their gifts. Um, so many people go through life chasing the shiny objects, you know, something that sounds great, sounds good. And because of, you know, society in general or the circumstances they may be in life, um, I think they, a lot of times, a lot of people overlook what their actual gifts are. Um, yeah. So they follow other passions that they think are their gifts that they think are going to bring them the riches and the wealth or whatever it is that they're looking for. When truly, if they find that God given talent or unlock the God given talent that we are all born with, then that's ultimately going to give them all the riches and all the wealth that they will ever need. And, you know, really what we're doing is trying to help individuals um, find that passion, find that gift, harness that gift, 
and unleash that gift to the entire world so that they can then receive all the blessings that are due upon them. Your, and your mission is all about unleashing the gift and transforming people. Exactly. So you tell me more about your mission, how, you, how, how you're going to convert your, your, your passion into your mission. It's, and it's very, it's very simple. Um, the main thing is this, this really all came together, you know, when I was thinking about the, you know, I guess what we call the future, you know, our future generations, our, our, my children, my son, who is 28 years old now. Um, when you look at it, and I know you've heard it before, you know, there's over uh, 7 billion individuals in the world. Um, only a small percentage of that are our young teens and children, but they are 100% of the future. And in order to you know, change you know, life 100 years from now, we have to be able to focus on those younger individuals. And that's what we're doing. And I do it you know, primarily through my initiative, but within my initiative, I have a program called SWAG, which is succeeding with a goal. Um, and what we do there is we really, it's a platform where individuals can, number one, they can aspire to be whatever they want to be, and they can be inspired to be whatever they want to be so that they can then t take the action that's actually needed to fulfill their dreams and become them best selves. And that's the whole premise around swag, which I built into you know, my initiative of civility through transitional leadership. I can see swag right behind you on both sides of you. Yes. <laughs> uh, what, uh, who inspires you the most, uh, uh, Vinny? It, I would say it's a tough question, but when I really think about it, it's not. Uh, my biggest inspiration um, since he was born has been my son. Um, and as I said, you know, my, my son is 28 years old. Um, he's a prime example in my, my humble and personal opinion of someone who harnessed his passion, his gift early on in life. And initially, you know, we, we almost hindered that. And what I mean by that, he was into playing video games and things that most young kids do. And like a lot of parents, you don't always want your kids 100% of the time on video games and things of that nature. So we would try to pull him away from that, you know, get him outside, play sports and things of that nature. But the more I did that, I found that he was really into the video games. So much so that he would order what they call the cheat books of a video game. He would read those first before he bought the video game and then he would sit down and it would take him, you know, an hour or so to master the actual video game. Um, so then that took him into another level of gaming. Um, you know, he went to college for computer programming and engineering, um, which was his passion. You know, he has built computers, you know, he's working on building video games. Um, and now that's what he's doing. You know, he's, he's followed his passion, his dream, and he's doing what he's always wanted to do instead of what so many other people and society in general told him he should be doing. You know, why are you gonna waste your time getting into a gaming industry? Um, why? Because it's something that he had a passion for. You know, since he was a child, you know, that's all he wanted. And as an adult now, that's what he does. And he loves it, he makes great money at it. Um, and that's really what it's all about, doing the thing that makes you truly happy, and hopefully it can also help benefit other individuals. Wow, that's, a, that's amazing. And it took you, I guess, a little bit of time just to understand what he was doing. Because if it, exactly. Know, if you didn't know he was doing the cheat thing to master the game, you would say this kid's wasting a lot of time. It, and I will tell you, it, I especially realized it once he actually graduated from college. Because um, when he graduated from college, you know, like a lot of college students, he wasn't getting, you know, the job offers that he wanted. Um, and he was sitting around, you know, in my mind, he wasn't working hard enough to get the job. Um, so I was telling him, you know, go out and get something just to get your foot in the door. 
Yeah. I mean, he was like, nope, I don't want to do that. And I was like, well, you got to do something. You know, you got to get out there and do something. And he said he was not going to settle just on a job um, because, you know, thank, thankfully for my time in the military, he went to school on my GI Bill. Um, so he didn't have to pay for it. You know, the, the government paid for it and they paid him extra money for being at school. You know, yeah. he was smart enough to save that money. So when he was out of college, you know, there wasn't a immediate need for him to go out and make money because he already had money. Wow. So then he could literally focus his time on the job that he actually wanted. And lo and behold, um, he got a phone call asking him to come in for an interview. And it was a panel interview and probably two or three of the individuals on that particular panel were alumni from his, his college. Um, and he got the job that he wanted. He's been there now, my goodness, uh, eight years, I think, well, seven years. Um, and he's, he's just enjoying life. <laughs> Amazing. And, and, and that's huge because you protected him from the stress of money. And, yes. and, and from most people kind of take a path because it's a money path and you need money to survive. And you were able to have him go through college financially free and come out financially free without any debt and land that passion job. And that's, that's amazing. Yes. And again, none of that for me would have been possible the way it was, you know, had it not been for my time in the military. Um, you know, I chose myself not to utilize my own GI Bill because that wasn't the path that I was looking for. You, right. know, you know, I'm not going to say I dislike school, but it just wasn't for me. Um, so I was more into the life experiences and learning that way. I have taken specific college courses on specific things that I wanted to learn, but I never had a desire to go get that piece of paper to hang up on my wall. Um, where my wife is totally opposite. My wife is doing that. She's done that. And um, she's now working on her dissertation for her doctorate. <laughs> That's incredible. Thank you. That's amazing. So you've, you've given him a great gift. Yes. And I'm, I'm so glad that you said he inspires you the most because I, I wouldn't have get that until my son is now, I learned so much from him. I look at him, what can I learn from you today? When I put him exactly. to sleep, I say, okay, we saw the birds today. We saw the car today. So I'm go. I'm kind of giving him a summary of what he learned, but I learned so much from just exactly. observing. Take it's the so amazing. Climbing up the step with a ball. <laughs> I can do the coolest things this minute I take my eyes off him. And the idea is to always keep your eyes on them. So he, he, he defy gravity and stuff. He, 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 <laughs> I turn around for two seconds. He's on the chair or on the table or up a step. <laughs> yeah. You got you got to watch him. But again, you like you said, you can learn so much at every age point that they are in their lives. Incredible, incredible. Now, what's uh, what's your uh, process? Trans. Not only did you coming out of going into the military as a transitional period and coming back out to integrate and not most people come back and put their foot up and just drink beers. So let's, let's, if we can cover that transition uh, period going into what it is in there. Uh, and cause you, you, you made it to the highest rank in the Marine Corps. So that's every rank is a transition, a different mindset. And, and so let's, let's, let's go uh, over that story kind of. Well, first of all, again, um, we'll, we'll take it as a story, and then we'll take the points out and get your um, okay, and, and get your uh, your steps. Well, I mean, I you know when I left high school, I actually had a very good job in New York City. You know, I worked in Manhattan at a very prestigious law firm. You know, as you know, because that initially was what I thought I wanted to do was be a lawyer, but then I realized I got to go to college to do that, and that yes. wasn't my that wasn't my plan. Um, so I joined the military with just thinking that I was only going to do four years 
and then I would go back to New York City, become a police officer. Um, again, because I just wanted to be able to help the community that I was in. Um, in those first four years, um, I started really enjoying what I was doing. I was in the communications field. Um, so I dealt with telecommunications, radio, telephones, all of those things and became very good at it. Um, right about my 10 year mark in the military is what, what I say to individuals, that's the point in the military at least where I think you really need to make the decision on whether or not you want to make that a career. And right. at the 10-year mark, I did, um, primarily because my son was already born. Um, so I was like, I need to make this a career. And I did, again, only with the expectation of serving 20 years and achieving um, a rank called gunnery sergeant in the Marine Corps, which is seven levels high in, in the military. Um, but because of the goals and the way that I set my goals, I blew past that goal early on, you know, in my, in my career. So at the 20 year mark, when I was due to retire is when I actually hit the highest rank in the military. Wow. Um, what so is what is it called? called Sergeant major. Sergeant major. Uh, so there, there you're an, you're an advisor, you know, to the commanders, to the generals, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a great position to be in. A lot of traveling, um, involvement with a lot of the younger troops. Um, so that inspired me again, you know, being around them, seeing how they think, you know, what they want to do in the future, you know, what they think the future holds for them. Um, so when I finally did retire, you know, I already knew I was never going to go get a job. Yes. Um, that was never going to happen. After serving 30 years, I'd already made a decision. I'm not going to work for anybody. And along my journey in the Marine Corps, I was an entrepreneur. Um, so I had worked with different companies while in the uh, military. I had a, a booth in the mall um, for, for a couple of years that I, that I ran and had people work it while I was working in the military. Amazing. You know, I didn't know you could do that. Yes. <laughs> You know, I, I've done network marketing, um, you know, you, you name it, I've, pr I've probably done it at some point or another. Um, so when I got out, you know, I knew I was just going to take a break for a little while. And I, I took off for about a year, you know, just relaxed, enjoying life and getting my plan together for what I wanted to do. Um, and then what I found out is I wanted to become a speaker. I wanted to teach leadership. I wanted to train on leadership. And I started developing my plan to do that. Um, wrote my first book, um, was able to co-author my second book with you and so many other, you know, great speakers and trainers. And then that eventually and ultimately. And where we can get it? Uh, my first book is called The Leader in You, Seven Steps to Unlocking Your Potential. And the way you get that is you go directly to my website, um, well, one of one or two of my websites. The first one is the leader in you 365.com. That's directly to the book site itself. Um, and the other website is my personal website, the Cochran.com. And you can get that book. But you know, after writing that first book and having the opportunity to link up and co collaborate with other authors like yourself in the second book, um, I knew that was the way to reach individuals. Get your message out, you know, to as many people as possible. Um, and that led me on the journey to creating my course, um, Swag. And um, that, that's been a, that's been like my baby now, um, that I'm just nurturing that, building it, watching it grow. Um, and initially, COVID-19, I thought it was going to hinder my ability to, to create that. But in actuality, what COVID has done is gave me more focus in order to make that happen. Um, so I'm just adding to it, making it bigger, um, getting ready to launch it on a, a major platform in October. Um, and then on the, the local platform, you know, here in the U.S., um, right about the same time. So I'm, I'm very happy about it, but I, I do coach people on a regular basis on that. Again, it's all about helping them 
you know, to do more, be more, and become more, and truly find and become their best selves through goal setting, mindset, belief, attitude, um, and what I call inspiring individuals. And when I use the term inspire, you know, I made it an acronym, which stands for intellectually navigating your senses while performing instant rejuvenation to your emotions. Wow. And it's, you know, I love, I love to play on words um, because I think it, it helps people relate to what I'm talking about. And when you look at inspiring individuals, I think so many of our youth have been inspired in the wrong ways, you know, by things that are, you know, in the media, uh, when they sit there and they watch the media or, or when they watch, um, you know, some of their favorite artists in, you know, the music industry, they're being inspired. And in a lot of ways, they're being inspired to do the wrong things. Um, so what I want to do is inspire individuals to, again, be their best selves and in, in navigating individual senses, because, you know, whether it's your sense of touch, your sense of sight, hearing, smell, and taste, all of these things actually create different emotions. And it's the emotions we have that actually make us take action. Um, so that's why emotions is the last thing. And rejuvenation is before that because we wanna really you know, revitalize your emotions, you know, make you feel good about something so that you can actually take action on it. Um, because we can have all the thoughts, all the ideas, all the wants we want in life. But if we don't take the action, nothing is going to get done. And we're not going to take the action if we don't have a good emotion and we don't feel good about what it is that we want to do. Amazing. And uh, Tony Robbins speaks about uh, motion creates emotion. Yes. And, and if, you wanna, if you can share your version of, of motion, emotion. The, the synergy and the dependency on each other. And, you know, like I said, with, with emotion, you know, it's like when you go back to the video that I think so many individuals in personal development have watched, The Secret. You know, when they talk about, you know, being able to visualize what it is that you want. Um, if it's the new car that someone is seeking, when you really look at it, it's not the actual object itself. It's the feeling you get when you sit inside that car is what you're looking to achieve. And that feeling is what's going to make you take the action. So that's how you connect the emotion with the actual action that you take. You want to feel good. You know, if you're, if you're in a bad mood, um, you're probably not going to move as effectively in life as you want to move. But if you feel good when you get up in the morning, you know, and you have somewhat of a plan about what it is that you want to do, the better you feel about yourself and how things are going to be throughout the day, the more you're going to do. Um, so just like he says, you know, you know, motion is continuous. It's just how much effort are you going to put into that actual emotion? And it's going to be based off of your emotions. Wow, that's incredible. I like how, how you, you made that big, big distinction. Most people say, I look at my, uh, um, my, my um, vision board all the time. I look, but it's, it's not just looking. If you're in a bad mood and you look, it might not do, do you yeah. any good. It might be <laughs> doing you the negative. So, oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, and we all, we all go through periods where we, we may feel a little bit negative, but what I've learned, especially in the military after 30 years, and I've done a lot of things and been to a lot of places, served in combat in different places. And what I've learned is regardless of how bad a situation may be or may look, you know, you have the power to determine how you're going to react to it. Mm -hmm. And I used to try to, you know, I can't say I did it with all of my young Marines, but I've always tried you know, to get them to see the best in any situation that we were in. You know, unfortunately, we lost Marines in, in combat. And that would get the average person down, obviously. 
Um, but, you know, I had to have them take a look at themselves and say, you know, yes, we lost this individual, but you're still here. You know, that's the great side of it. Um, and nothing that we do, nothing that we can do, you know, the training that we do can prevent us from being called home when it's our time to be called home. Um, so what I would always tell them is, you know, look for the good in everything. Have a smile on your face when you wake up. Have a smile on your face when you go to sleep at night and just know that, you know, when the time comes, you know, when you are finally called home, you need to be able to look at yourself and say, you know, I did my best at everything that I could and I had a great attitude about it. Wow, that's amazing. Now, what's your, you have a method, a, a Vinny culture method for, for, for tra transitioning? Yes. And again, it, it goes back to uh, when you look at swag, it's really about changing the way the younger generation thinks. It's also changing their expectations, you know, uh, and it doesn't matter about what their circumstances are. Um, and I think that's the, that's the big thing that we try to infuse, you know, in the program of swag you know, and transitional leadership. A lot of people get wrapped around, you know, where they grew up at or where they're living, you know, their circumstances in their society. Because I live here, you know, I'm destined to be this type of person. Um, so we need to have individuals change their expectations by using examples of other people. You know, somebody from where you came from made it out of where you came from and became successful. You know, the only difference between them and you is the decision that they made. And again, that decision comes from them implementing, you know, visualization, changing their mindset, changing their attitude, um, and eventually having a plan. And then it all comes back to, again, inspiring individuals to do more, be more, and become more. That's incredible. Um, I'd like, uh, do you have a famous quote from someone else that you like to use? And I love, I know you have one of your own that you like to use too. So uh, if you can provide that. Um, the, probably the Socrates is probably one of my, my fa favorite quotes. And I'm, well, I got a bunch of them. So I'm going to see which one yes. I'll utilize today, which probably would be um, I cannot teach anyone anything. I can only make them think. And that's, that's Socrates. So that's, that's probably my favorite quote because so many people go out and I think, you know, their goal is I want to teach. I want to teach. I want to teach. And especially when you're looking at the younger generation, I think one of the last things they want is to be taught anything. Because number one, they believe they know everything. So they don't want to be taught. So if I can simply make them think about something, you know, to change their, you know, maybe change their thought process, then we start to get somewhere. They open up a little bit more. Amazing. So you're not focusing on a situational um, uh, transition, but more of a, a systematic uh, a transition. So they can have the tools necessary to use it. Any Exactly. I mean, everything, as, as I'm sure you know, you know, all the great things that have been created and are continuously running, they all run on systems. Yes. Um, so if we can create systems to help an individual master themselves, which is, you know, somewhat of what I know and believe in my heart that swag does. Um, it's like, you know, the ability for a, a young 17 year old to run a million dollar McDonald's co company. Why? Because it's a system. It yeah. doesn't matter, you know, what McDonald's you walk into and any McDonald's in the world, they're all set up the exact same way. Wow. You know? And that's why a 17 year old without a high school diploma can run, manage and operate a million dollar organization like McDonald's. And that's what we're trying to do with swag. Give them a, a very simple system that they can utilize to number one, find out what their gift is, you know, hone in on that gift, come up with 
goals and a plan, not necessarily a timeline, but at least a plan of how they're going to release that gift to the world and not even worry about how they're going to benefit from it. It's really good. And uh, do you have a, a, a quote, a famous quote of your own that you'd like to share? Yes. And it, it's very simple. I think I have it at the very beginning of my book. Um, and it's simply, you know, it, it ties in two things that I believe helps individuals that have that great attitude that will ultimately lead them to success. And the first part of it is motivation. Um, because again, that comes with the, the emotions needed to actually take action. You have to have that motivation. Um, and everything you do, um, have to have fun with it because that fun is going to bring a smile to your face. And one thing I've learned is, you know, it is basically impossible to smile and be upset at the same time. So the more fun you learn how to have, the better off your life is going to be. So one of my favorite quotes of my, my personal quotes is, if you're not motivated and you're not having fun, it's your own damn fault. <laughs> you're not motivated and you're not having fun. It's your own, it's damn, your own damn fault. <laughs> that, I think this is going to be a great closing quote for your chapter. And uh, did you want to, uh, last word, sum everything up, what would you like to put out there as an as a ending uh, paragraph? Uh, only thing I would say is, again, uh, when we're looking in terms of, you know, civility and how we can all really practice the golden rule of, you know, basically treating everyone as we would have them, you know, treat us, um, is to learn yourself. You know, we all have to look in the mirror and take an honest assessment of ourselves, understanding, again, what we're good at, you know, what, what we may be a little bad at, what we need to work on, and how we can contribute to the rest of the world so that the world can be a better place. Um, so much so now in, I'm not going to say society, but here in the United States, as you know, we're getting ready to go through an election. And yes. I won't even get into my you know, party affiliation or anything, but one of the things you see in this country is when you get into election time, it's always about putting the other person down so that they can bring themselves up. You know, instead of saying, this is who I am and this is what I can do to make this country or this state a better place. And that's what civility is all about. You know, we're not in competition with anyone else. We're simply here to make ourselves better so that ultimately we can make the world a better place, one person at a time. Everyone you come in contact with, if you can be civil to them, then chances are they can be civil to someone else. And it's just something that, you know, regenerates over and over and over. So we initially have to just take a, a long, hard look in the mirror and assess who we are as individuals. Wow. So it's, it's basically, uh, it, it starts with me, and the most I can do is be civil to that one, two, or three person I meet. Exactly. In contact. Exactly. Rather than trying to change the whole world by yourself. Exactly. The, the way we change the world is one person at a time. Amazing. And, and we can add a, a Gandhi quote in there. Be, be the change you want to see. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> awesome, sir. Uh, did you want to add anything else? Uh, no, I, I, I think that's it. You know, it's, you know, it's always a pleasure, you know, talk with you. I am definitely so honored and privileged to be a part of this, you know, this World Civility Presidential Club. Uh, you mean, you have no idea because I know the impact, you know, that it's going to make um, and the ability that I now have to get my message across to so many other people. Yes, sir. Your message uh, becomes a mission. Your message is you. The mission is going to be in the book. And as, we got, as the book get out and, and, and through a World Civility Club, it's going to become a movement. And those yes. are the three M's I love. Yes. Uh, uh, message is personal. 
mission becomes you get a few people involved and then we create a movement. Yes, exactly. Love it. <laughs> have a lot of uh, change effected. Thank you for your time, sir. I appreciate you. Uh, and we'll get this to you in, in about a week. No problem. Thank you. And I appreciate you as well. Tell Dr. Rivers I said, hey. Yes. And if, um, if you want to update your chapter, you still can. If you want to change anything, if not, um, we'll, we'll go uh, with the one we have. Okay. Gotcha. Excellent. And All right. Picture still, if you'd like. I know no you're always having photo shoots. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. All right. Take care.